So welcome to Events Heist, the podcast game show about post-COVID events and event managers. Today we'll be playing with Miguel and Klaus. Miguel, could you kick off introducing yourself with your name, title, and company? Sure. Uh, Miguel Neves, Editor-in-Chief of Event MB. Fantastic. And Klaus, over to you. Klaus Rosted, and I'm the Director of the College of Extraordinary Experiences. So you'll both be starting at the helicopter and the aim of this game is to get to the mint. It's a snakes and ladders board game, but we've made it more appropriate to events because every two steps you take forward, you'll probably take 10 steps backwards. If you land on an open manhole, you'll move back down the board and then ladders will let you jump ahead. So let's begin with you, Miguel. All right, you've rolled the two and you're up the ladder. So your first question well. is, how many years have you been an events organizer or involved in the uh, event space? About well, so 2015, I really started off. So about 16 years, no, sorry, 2005. So about 16 years now. All right, over to you, class. You rolled a five. A five. And your question is, how many events have you run in your professional career? I stopped counting after a thousand. Wow, that is that's probably the highest that I've heard on this on this show. Uh, fantastic! And do you know roughly what the split between virtual and uh, live events is? Uh, <laughs> let's just say that even though I run quite a lot of virtual events, I stopped counting at that thousand a long time ago. So that's uh, ago. that's live events. All right, Miguel, you've rolled a one. It's the same question. Uh, how many events have you run in your professional career? Well, definitely not as many as Klaus, say probably a couple hundred, maybe 150, something like that. And if you include uh, you know, events that I was part of a team running kind of thing. And w do you know what the split between virtual and live is? That's a good question. They've definitely kind of evened out a little bit in the last year for, as, as I'm sure for a lot of people, but I'd probably say about 20 or 30% virtual and the rest live. Class, you wrote a six. I did. I'm that good. All right. So your question is, what's the biggest event you've ever organized? Biggest event I've ever organized? Oh, that depends on how you count. But one of those where I had kind of a key position in designing was a, a double event for two times 5,000 people. All right. Over to you, Miguel. You wrote a six. So Miguel, tell me about the first event you organized. And if it was as a kid, that's, that's good too. That's even better. Sure. So I used to be in the music industry in Portugal, roadieing and stage managing for bands amongst other random stuff. I actually ended up doing a, a corporate dinner with the band that I was roadieing for. And it just sort of hit me that these people in suits that were hanging out, having dinner, and then the band was playing were part of an event. And those busloads of people in suits that I would see around the city weren't tourists. They were people at events. And so I had no idea that this thing, the events industry existed. And it was, it was a really kind of weird kind of like, oh, that's what these people are doing kind of situation. And it all kind of unraveled from there. I found this, this industry that I kind of had no idea existed. So that was probably the first event that I was very conscious of being a, at least from the corporate B2B side, that was the first time I realized what it was. All right, class, you rolled a three. Class, have you met any celebrities on the job? <laughs> yeah. So I think my most, uh, my, my funniest story there is either wrestling Matthew McConaughey's older brother on a West Texas investor show. That's number one. The other is meeting, what's the guy who starred in 20. He was in 24 and played the black president. He was really good. And I meet him and I'm drunk. So I say, so Denzel, what are you doing in <laughs> Copenhagen? And he, he laughs politely, um, but others looked a bit scandalized. Uh, I, I know the guy you're talking about. I was a fan of uh, On24. All right, Miguel, over to you, you rolled a one. All right, so your question is, what's your favorite post-event drink or junk food or both? Drink would probably just have to be a, a nice cold beer, like a lager. I'm just a fan of relatively simple beers. But food, I have to say something like a burger or something like that. 
Because what, what I find is a lot of events serve really rich food, but it ends up being a lot of finger food, right? So you end up with this like thing in your stomach where like you've eaten all this like really fatty, really greasy stuff, but it's all in really tiny portions. So at the end of an event, I like to just have a like a like a really regular meal, a steak or a burger, and just kind of sit and eat the whole thing and be like, yes, okay, this is a normal meal and sort of try to regulate the system back to normal and away from event mode. All right, class, you wrote a five. I seem to be rolling better than Miguel, but I'm doing not nearly as well. I think this is life in a nutshell. Well, this is actually a cooperative game. So if there's any questions you get that you don't have a good answer, you feel free to lifeline. Lifeline lets you defer to the other player. And then you as the person answering get to move to the furthest spot. So if they're in front of you, you move up to their spot. If they're behind you, they can move up to your spots. It's a, we, we've added that element to this to make it a, a cooperative game. So Klaus, uh, what do you love or hate about events? Or maybe it's the same thing. What I love about events is meeting the people and seeing them connect and seeing kind of the, the delight in their eyes, seeing people who were strangers the day before who are now going to be lifelong friends. That is, is one of the things, connecting people. I, I think that that gives me boundless joy. And on the kind of, let's just say, on the annoying side is people who have a feeling that I, as a live events organizer, am in control of the universe and everything in it. <laughs> that's especially stuff you don't know. That's, that's always really funny. And I'm not going to go into detail because we've all been there. But let's just say that sometimes I wish I was as powerful as people thought I am. I am sadly not even close to anything like that. Over to you, Miguel. You wrote a five. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the same question as Klaus. Have you met any celebrities on the job? And what were they like? Most of them have been really nice. I think the, probably the biggest celebrity moment was 2005 as well. The, um, European MTV Music Awards. I worked backstage and I was hanging out with Coldplay for a little while. And so Chris oh, nice. Martin was running around backstage looking for some silly sunglasses to make some like little short clip that they were doing. So I was kind of like trying to help him out. And I remember I went to like the depths of everybody's handbags to find some random sunglasses. And by the time I found something interesting, later already filmed it and they were like long gone. So I was a complete loser looking for sunglasses. So that's oh. me. The class, you wrote a four. Oh, and oh, back down no. the manhole. So and this is a perfect timing to ask this question. So describe the moment, the very moment, and we all have this, when you knew COVID was going to turn our industry upside down. <laughs> I'm going to reverse that. And I'm going to describe, because in January 2020, I was in an investor meeting and we were just closing investment on what was going to be a live experience museum. And one of the guys says, let's just wait a week and see what happens in China. And two of the guys from our team, and I was one of them, says, no matter what happens there, it's not going to affect us here. But sure, if you want to, that's, of course, fine. See you in a week. Let's just say that that comment didn't age well. All right. Okay, Miguel, over to you. You roll the two. All right, same question. What, what oh, question? Miguel, you're, you're racing ahead. So same question. Damn. Describe the moment you knew COVID was going to throw everything out the door. I think it was probably, yeah, last, last travel that I did. I was in Finland in early March of last year, so just over a year ago. And they were doing really well with, with uh, the pandemic at that point. That didn't look like it was really affecting them that much. But still, all the events were canceled. You know, everything was sort of shutting down. And I remember going to the airport and the airport was completely empty. I, you know, there was like one thing open. It's like, OK, this is this is going to be a bit different from now on. I don't think I had a crystal ball and knew that it was going to last the whole year. But I was like, OK, this is this is deep. This is going to change a lot. So uh, and I was just happy to kind of get back home and, and hunker down. So that was my moment. Class, you rolled a six. So what do you miss the most about live events and what do you not miss? I miss 
the people, the fun, the on-site unexpectedness, and the the kind of that kind of the stress that is good, the hilariousness of doing something live with all the things that entails. I really, I really miss that. What I don't miss is the exact same stress when things go bad. Because one of the nice things about doing things digitally, there's so much less you have to control. The odds that somebody loses a key that you need at a key point because that person wasn't thinking is much less if you're sitting in a com- before a computer and you control everything yourself. So I love the fact that there's so, there's so few moving parts. But one of the things I love about live events is the moving parts. So it's a little bit of a, a, a split Okay, Miguel, you've rolled a five. What's the weirdest food you've ever eaten at an event? Oh, you can ask me, Miguel. <laughs> no, you I can want to you can Go on. I want to hear the answer. I want to hear the answer, though. I don't know, really. Uh, you go. You go ahead. That's all right. You, you can laugh. You have a good one. Tell a good story. Yeah. All right. The first time I was introduced to. Uh, bug candy and in general uh, insect food was at an event by a Venezuelan bug chef that we later brought on to help do the college and that was pretty wild just cur- out of curiosity what did it taste like surprisingly okay I mean what he'd done was he'd taken all this bug stuff and he would made it clear so you visually had like a grasshopper popsicle it was like i think he called it a grass hopsicle something silly like that but he presented it so elegantly that people got into it who would never have done that sort of thing and they found out that of course the taste isn't the problem it's all psychological so there was no taste problem i'm not going to say it tastes like chicken but it's, it's that one of those moments but it was lovely and, and i've been on the it's not that i consume bugs every day but i'm no longer afraid of bug food in the way i was Fantastic. Okay, class, you get to move up over to Miguel. And right, Miguel, your question. What industries have you done events for? And what was your favorite? Most of my events are for people that do events. So it's quite meta, you know, tough audience. I've done medical stuff. I've done academic stuff as well. I think I have to say my favorite is events for event people. Because it's so meta, there's so many inside jokes and there's so much sort of learning from each other behind the scenes, which I think is a lot of fun, but it has its challenges, right? Like it's, it, they're, it's a really tough audience. And sometimes there's, I don't know, the, the color on a sign is slightly off or the, you know, the offsetting on the sign or something is off and somebody will notice it and kind of, you know, send you an email saying, I just wanted to let you know that I noticed that little thing. I'm like, thank you. That, 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 that really made my day. I really appreciate that. So it's a fun audience. <laughs> okay, over to you, class. You wrote a four. All right, so you've got to get exact numbers to reach the last counter before the game can end. All right, so class, what do you think the future of events looks like? I think a lot of it is going to rebound to to previous things, tourism especially. But I think what we're really going to see is two huge changes. Make that three. Number one is conferences are going to either be virtual or be better because the amount of absurdly bad conference design and conference speakers and just straight out boredom that we've tolerated in the past. I think we're now going to tolerate a lot less of that. And when we do, it's going to be virtual. So that's number one. Number two is that when physical events are something we do, then it's because they need to be physical, not just because, oh, I'm going to get on a plane, fly 16 hours to do a one hour meeting and fly 16 hours back. I think we're going to see a lot less of that kind of physical micro event, also known as business travel that we did before. And finally, anything that has to do with education, because what's what's happening with COVID is whether it's education, public speaking, that's a conference, conference speaking is we're seeing people who are bad, just it becomes obvious how bad they really are. We've had an extremely forgiving environment globally for bad teachers, for bad conference speakers, for bad business kind of educators. And the digital, let's just say the digital snap we've been part of has made that extremely clear because it's just so much harder. So I think we're gonna see that the people who get on stages and how they get on stages, that's gonna change a lot. Thanks for that. That was a great, great answer. So Miguel, you've rolled a six. 
No, I kind of go backwards. And you go backwards. That's right. Oh, do I fall down as well? No, no, not yet. Okay, so virtual events, fan or not a fan? I'm a fan, but you know, with a lot of qualifiers. I think I, I agree with everything that Klaus was saying. I think it, yeah, we're, we've been doing a lot of bad events. I also think we've been doing a lot of bad virtual events. So I'm oh. a fan, but I think, yeah, I think that we need to really up our game and we're not going to have a lot of patience for what I call the dreaded one hour webinar where, you know, you get tiny little bullet points and people speaking at the audience. And then it's like, we'll save the last five minutes for Q and A. And then, you know, that doesn't even happen because you actually only have 30 seconds. We were going to do some questions, but we'll, we'll do it later. And, and then it never happens. I'm a big fan, but I think the bar is, is, is raising and raising and raising. And I think we're going we're gonna to have to reinvent them and, and come up with new stuff you know, pretty soon. I'm, I am seeing a lot of cool new stuff coming up, but it's still the minority. And I, I really want to make that the majority. So I'm looking forward to creating some, some really fun stuff. All right, class, over to you. You rolled a three. So have you read something recently or seen a TV show that you'd like to share with other event professionals? And you can lifeline, so just remember. Yes, I want to ask Miguel about that. All right, over to you, Miguel. Same question. I'm a big nonfiction reader, and the last kind of serious piece of nonfiction I read was Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Really mm -hmm. interesting book about psychology and kind of understanding just our, our brains and how we work. And the, the whole premise of the book is that we have two systems in our heads. There's like a lazy intuitive system, system one, and system two is the really kind of factual, logistical kind of, you know, making sense of the world uh, system. And, and basically the whole book says, look, we're basically stuck on system one. We're stuck on that intuitive kind of, you know, that's where we actually make all our decisions. And then we use system two very rarely, or when we really kind of force ourselves to think. And usually that's just used to justify the decision that we've already made. And what I love about kind of reading that, and it's, it's 400 pages long, tiny print. So there's a lot of like backing this up and all these sorts of studies that they did. What I love about that is it really kind of makes the point of, if you want to make an event that kind of gets a point across, if you want to communicate something, you have to do it in a fun way. You have to do it in a way that engages senses. You have to do it in a, in a, in a way that really kind of gets interaction going because or else you have no chance of getting to that system too. Like you need to get people in a state of flow. You need to get them thinking about stuff and then hit them with like the really hard information. If you start with a lot of information, you've basically lost everybody. So there's there's huge amount of kind of interesting stuff in that book. If, if, you, if people want to read and get into that, I think that really kind of gets into the crux of what engaging meetings and kind of effective meetings really are. Seconded. Thanks for that. Okay, Klaus, over to you. You... Uh, your question is, do you have any funny or crazy event stories? I'm not going to tell it because it's a little bit too long, but I'm going to okay. refer to where you find it. I'm currently doing 100 innovation keynotes in 100 days. And one of the first ones, I think it's number seven or eight, is a story called maximizing the odds when you're in deep shit, something like that. And, and that's 12 minutes and you will not regret it. All right, over to you, Miguel. You've rolled a one. Uh, almost there. I've heard a lot of people saying hybrid events is the, the new normal. What's your take on that? The, first, the question you just asked, Klaus, I think he, he, he should have like six goes at that question because I know a few of Klaus's stories and, and there's some great stories. Now for this question, I think there's two sides to this. One is what is hybrid? I think everybody's really, there's completely different definition of what hybrid is. You know, at its basic is like there's an online component and an in-person component to an event that can mean a million different things and it can be synchronous or asynchronous or all sorts of things that you could do with that at the end of the day for me there's sort of energy like people come together and there's focused energy i think that's a really important part and there's content and how you mix those two and how people consume and interact with those two that's really what defines what your hybrid experience would end up being uh, and i think Hybrid is not going to be the solution to everything. And, and if you're looking at hybrid as like this experience that happens at the same time and you get people online to speak to people that are uh, in person, I'm not sure that's actually going to happen. I think it's going to be really tough for you to get people that are having a good time in person and having a good event to stop everything and connect with somebody who's sitting in front of their computer at home. And I, I would actually argue that's really counterproductive to the experience in person. 
So I, I'm a big believer in creating, you know, an interesting event, interesting content, exploring the best way for people who are home or who are in another city, but maybe together with other people to consume that, to interact with that and creating a really good VIP experience for the people who are in person where that is happening. In that sense, I'm a big fan of hybrid and I think it, it can really work, but it is very resource intensive. It can be very expensive depending on equipment, but at least in terms of resources to make it all come together, it's incredibly resource intensive. So yeah, I think in the middle of all that, there's really good opportunity, but we've got to keep those things in check so that we just create really good experiences for whoever and whichever way they want to participate. All right, class, over to you. You rolled a two, so you have made it to the mint. Fantastic. So well, your question is, how do you think, well, firstly, do you think Zoom fatigue is real uh, as described? And if so, yes. how do you think it's affecting virtual events? So one, yes, Zoom fatigue is very real. You don't have to take my word for that. That's kind of like, is gravity real? Yes, definitely. And how it's affecting virtual events is that, well, Miguel said it very nicely earlier when he said we have that dreaded one hour Zoom webinar of terrible quality, that we're trained in the physical world to be able to go through a lot of kind of boring, annoying time. Because we're trained from the first time we set foot in a school that's been trained that looks like it's 200 years old and is teaching the same way. Virtually, we don't have that training. So we simply just give up a lot faster. If you, take, if you take kids and you train them for 15 years or 10 years in being at like daily Zoom meetings, they're probably gonna be pretty good at being in terrible daily Zoom meetings by the time they're 15 or 20. But for us as adults, we're pretty good at being bored in person. We're terrible at it in front of a screen. Also because it's so much easier just to kind of tap out. It's never been easier to tap out than it is during a digital meeting. So, so yes, very, very real what that means for events. It means we need to up our game because if we don't, then we need to force people. And there's a quote from a German manager who I, let's not say I work with them, but was just uh, overheard this for no apparent reason who said, if I can't see them, my employees, how do I know they're working? Which is terrible, <laughs> but is also, unless we're going down that path, unless we're going down the path of, extreme surveillance, then we need to get better at doing what we do because people are simply not going to go for it. They're, they're not gonna accept the shitty quality of most kind of Zoom-based events. It can work fine, but it needs to be a lot better than it is now. And there's a rant there that I'll not do because we don't have time. This was <laughs> awesome. the light rant. All right. So since class, you've reached the end, let's move Miguel up to the top and because we're hitting time. So last question for you, Miguel. Hmm, let's finish on a good one. If you could have one unlimited supply of anything during an event, what would it be? I'm going to go for something really boring, but I'm going to go bandwidth. bandwidth. Like if I could get everybody to have like unlimited bandwidth, on on their on their devices or whatever it is you could do some pretty cool stuff like like ar vr kind of mixed technology get all crazy and i think we're probably you know like maybe 10 years time we'll probably get to that moment so i i could you know there's this like unlimited technical possibilities that you could do there so yeah i don't know that, that would be kind of interesting to explore what that looks like okay so we're going to finish off with one more for class just to round it out uh, when do you think live events will be returning in your country and region? Pretty soon, but when they'll be returning and what live, I mean, live events are already here. I'm part of a nonprofit and that's already doing live events and we're not the only ones. They're small, they're controlled, they're different. So live events are already back, but kind of the, the big live events, the ones that people talk about when they mean live events, like a hundred thousand person festival. My guess is Denmark, where I'm in, probably somewhere in the late summer slash fall, because we're privileged bastards. Maybe the really big stuff early 2022, because it also needs planning and cutting it close to the edge feels a little bit risky right now. Right. So we've hit time. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We'd love to have you. <laughs>